is actually not being loving to herself doing this for me? It's not quite like that. I tell you, it's... Um... Well, shall we cover that one first? Then? Okay. <laughs> and then you tell me the one that it is like. I'm not saying this is what it's like in your situation. I'm just saying that this is a transaction that often has occurred. If I'm in a state where I've received divine love, when somebody tries to do something for me that I feel they're actually not doing it from a state of love, but actually a state of self-harm, I will prevent them from doing it. In other words, I won't engage them in the transaction. Now, give it, let me give you a really basic example of that. Let's say I have lots of money and a friend of mine has very little money. If that friend of mine comes to me and says, look, I'll work for you for $10 an hour, and this is what I'll do, when I know that the going rate for that particular thing, in terms of what the world says the going rate is, is $18 an hour, if I said yes to them, what would I be doing? <laughs> I'm now actually deciding to use their own injury for my own benefit yes. and against them. Yes. And the same transaction occurs in partnerships many times. All right? Where we're, we're actually using the, own, the injury of the person against them. So for example, if I know my partner, my female partner, has a real strong feeling of responsibility for my emotions, so she feels responsible. One of my emotions happens to be a feeling of rejection. Let's say it's sexual rejection. I know my partner feels responsible for my emotions, and then one of the emotions that's within me is an emotion of sexual rejection. What am I going to be projecting on my partner? Don't reject me sexually. Don't reject me sexually. She's going to feel responsible for my emotion. So she is going to enter sexual transactions with me that she doesn't really want to enter at the time, just so that I don't feel my sexual rejection. Now, if I'm in that transaction, I am being unloving towards her. I am allowing her to do something, take responsibility for my emotions, which is the thing I'm allowing her to do, and I'm allowing her to do a bit so that I don't have to take responsibility for my own emotion, which happens to be sexual rejection. Can you see that? And often this happens in partnerships with regard to sexuality. Often what we do is we're projecting this emotion at the other person. We don't even have to say anything, you know. You don't have to say a word, actually, in these transactions. They will feel the emotion, right? So I'm out there crying about sexual rejection that's okay because I'm feeling my own emotion. But if I'm projecting that you're sexually rejecting, you're sexually rejecting me all the time at my partner and she feels responsible, and I know she feels responsible, I'm going to get more sex, right, aren't I? But it's not a very loving transaction, is it? And it's not a love and sex transaction. It's just a sex transaction, and it's there to help me avoid my emotion. So don't get involved in those transactions. Well, what will happen when you receive divine love to a certain degree? You will not even want to get involved in that kind of a transaction. The instant you notice that she's trying to take responsibility for your emotion, you will stop her and say, no, no, you're not responsible for my emotion. This is my emotion. I'm not going to have sex with you now, even though I badly, badly want it so that I can <laughs> not sexually reject it. I'm going to own this emotion. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so quite often what's happening is, now, she may then say, oh, but I'm being loving to him. She may have this feeling that being loving is being sensitive to his emotion. Well, true, love will always be sensitive to the other person's emotion, but it won't be responsible for their emotion, which is the injury. It won't do that. Further on to that, is that what you call when Can you just wait for the mic? Wherever it is? You wanted to mention another thing though. Or does that cover it? Sort of. Um, 
sort of. Yeah, AJ, it's, it's more um, like <laughs> there's an imbalance in the, uh, somehow there's not enough inclusion of yourself. There's not enough exclusion of what you're, yourself in wanting the loving experience. Um, inclusion of yourself or of the other? Or, or of <laughs> the other, not including themselves. It's an it's it's an out of balance. It's not yes. it's not so so much this sort of transaction. It's a, um, <laughs> it, it, it's as though it would be better if um, each could could get in touch with their own feeling of wanting this good experience for mm -hmm. themselves and then extend it out <laughs> to yeah. yes. If this person has a pure desire for themselves to experience something, yes. that is also going to be the purest transmission of love for yeah. the other person. Yeah. So, for example, in that kind of a transaction, if, if I just hunger for my woman's body, yeah. because just looking at it just blows me away, then that's the feeling I feel within myself. If I allow that feeling to be present in myself completely, that is the time when the other person is going to feel it to the maximum amount as well. So, that's a, so yes, you do need to feel your desires completely. And, and when you shut down your desires, or you detune your desires, or try to tame them for the other person, straight away that taints that process. So this is an aspect of self-love. You want the good experience for yourself. Yes, yes. An aspect of self-love is you will want that good experience, like with all of your heart. That's what passion is. Yeah. And so when I say you have passion for your woman, in your case, you, you would have a complete passionate desire for your woman, 24 by 7, waking or asleep, you will feel this feeling for her, for her body, for her soul, for her emotions, for her feelings, everything. You will just feel this complete. And you'll feel them whether she feels them or not. And you won't sacrifice them to, in order for her to feel more comfortable. Does that make sense? So, so let's, say, let's say my partner feels very uncomfortable with sexual attention. I won't sacrifice this emotion of this really pure sexual attention feeling that I feel towards her. I won't sacrifice that in order for her to get away from feeling unwanted sexual attention. If I love myself, is that that's more along the lines? Yes. Um, that will weave into what you were saying. If you can hold the mic a bit closer, so I can hear. Just going back to what you were saying, um, being someone. Oh, it uses someone else's weakness for their gain. Mm -hmm. I know that's not. It's not loving. Loving. Yep. So, what happens? I can't do that because what happens? I get what I call a big emotion inside. There's actually a penalty that happens upon your own soul when you choose to use somebody else's emotional injury for your gain. And if you're sensitive to it, you will feel it instantly. You will feel a feeling of compensation. It's a feeling of guilt, actually, a bad conscience. You will feel it the instant you do it. I call it spiritual indigestion. Yeah. <laughs> and you'll feel it straight away within yourself. And the other one, um, how do you know when you get into a relationship and you talk about this um, loving desire, how would I know whether it's because I'm trying to fulfill a need? Um, it will be exposed in you if, if it's to fulfill the other person's need. You see, a person who's needy will, will eventually, you, you will give, you will give, but their neediness will never be satisfied. And in the end what will happen is your king, if you start having a feeling like, oh, I'm giving, I'm giving, and this is exhausting me, Right? If you're starting having that feeling, then that means that is the pain of you giving in a situation that's unloving to yourself. Do you follow me? 
you need to be sensitive to your own emotions to know when you're actually breaking the laws of love. And that's how you know. You will feel a painful feeling if you're doing something that you thought was good. Yeah. So this is where a lot of times we don't have to think things through. All we need to do is tune into the emotion that we feel at that moment. And then we'll work out the truth of it. So many people I talk to, like, like many people, are, they say, oh, this is what that my partner's doing. My partner's doing this, my partner's doing that, my partner's doing this. And I say, what are you thinking? What do you feel? Unloved, unwanted, uncared for, all these feelings. The other feelings you're avoiding by telling me about your partner. Because, because I can't change your partner. He's not even here, in most cases, when they're saying these things. All we can do is change what is my law of attraction. My law of attraction is my partner feels like I'm unwanted by my partner, then I have an emotion within me that needs to be healed that I feel unwanted by a person of the opposite sex. So they're just mirroring your feeling. They're just, they're just mirroring to me my feeling. Now, once I work through that feeling, my partner may still try to do that if they have an injury that's the opposite, but I will no longer respond to it and I'll no longer be attracted to that. And I'll no longer complain about it because I will have dealt with it and moved on. Now, it's uh, 5 to 3, so it might be a good time to stop and have a break, shall we? It's near the end of the tape too, isn't it? It's good having a good pin mag with everyone, isn't it? to do now is be a little more specific about some injuries. Uh, sexual, we're talking sexuality still by the way, and love. So be a bit more specific about some injuries so that we can uh, maybe deal with some practical issues and tomorrow, when we have our session tomorrow, feel free to ask questions. By the way, tomorrow what I want to do with the questions is a little differently. I don't want you to write down questions. What I would like you to do is come up and talk about the question. Um, now, I know that's going to be quite triggering for many of you. And the reason why it's a much better thing to do is that firstly, I can connect emotionally to you, which means that I can actually feel your emotion a lot better than just reading, reading the question and trying to feel who in the audience actually wrote this question. Right? So it's much easier for me to connect with you emotionally. Then. Uh, the second reason is that um, many of us have questions that other people have. And they're just not brave enough to ask them either, right? And uh, if, you can learn, if you can learn to just be open with things, and if we can learn to be open sexu with sexuality, it would be a much better world that we live in today. So part of that process is just stopping. If, if you feel embarrassed about asking a question, then we can feel that embarrassment. Do you know what I mean? That embarrassment is a part of the question. The, the feeling of shame or embarrassment is a part of what you're experiencing. So just your own embarrassment, we will be able to feel and then work through those issues. Uh, thirdly, uh, if we involve people up the front, the audience then connects to the, to the emotion. And you'll find that many people in the audience have the same emotion. And you'll find it's very, very powerful for each one to connect. And um, some of you may have uh, not been present at the parenting children question day that we had. And so it was a beautiful question though because what happened was um, some of the, ch the children actually came up with their parents and actually spoke to their parents about how they were feeling and it was very very powerful for not only them who came up but also for the audience and it was just a wonderful way of working through a lot of issues so um, you know I just feel that if we can connect more closely to the questions rather than being anonymous it's actually very helpful. Bearing that in mind uh, if you feel in very embarrassed about doing that, I'm still willing to have a look at some questions. And if we run out of people willing to come up to the front, <laughs> then I'll get to the questions. <laughs> all right. So really, um, all sexual injuries are love injuries. So it's very important to see that. And we're talking about now a specific type of love, erotic love injuries. 
So all <coughs> sexual injuries are erotic love injuries. And many of them also are not just erotic love injuries, but injuries towards the same or opposite. Is that how it's called? Sex. And, and this is why they are so important to deal with. Because when we have an injury towards a male or an injury towards a female, or an injury towards ourselves, in all of those three aspects, we will never be able to connect to God. So you will find that as you deal with an injury towards the opposite sex, you will find a stronger connection towards the, that, that side of God, if you like, as well. And as you deal with the injuries towards the same sex, you'll find a more of a stronger connection to that side of God. And then as you deal with the injuries, and this is the ones that are most powerful, the injuries you have towards yourself, you'll find that the reception of love from God will intensify very, very rapidly. So, bearing in mind that all love injuries are usually injuries about ourselves, <coughs> means that it's a very powerful way for you to work through rapidly your relationship with God. So if you can see dealing with these love injuries with your partner as a way of drawing close to God, that'll be very powerful for you. So the focus then becomes, instead of actually becoming dealing with your partner or your own injuries, if you can picture God, I'll draw God like that, so God there, your half of the soul here, let's say it's me, masculine heart. If you can just focus your attention on developing your relationship with God. Now as you focus your attention on developing your relationship with God, there's two things that will be confronted. Your love of God, in other words, your love for something outside of yourself. In other words, the development of your natural love, the love that comes from within you for something outside of yourself, that'll be confronted. So it's the love that you give will be confronted. Right? That will be one of the main things confronted. The second thing that will be confronted is if you are not receiving divine love, the thing that will be confronted is the love that you allow yourself to receive. Now bearing in mind that all sexual injuries are love injuries, it would make sense if I can actually heal within myself all of my injuries towards receiving love. And if I can heal within myself all of my injuries towards giving about giving love, now I am in a perfect condition to be love in my relationships, including in the erotic relationship that I have with a partner. Can you see that? So if we allow ourselves to work through those two injuries with God. Now, the beauty of working through an injury with God is that God doesn't have an injury. <laughs> Can you see the positive side of that? <laughs> so if I'm not feeling a feeling of love coming from God, whose problem is it? It's not God's. <laughs> right? It's our own. But yet, if I was working through the same injury with a partner, what would I be feeling if I wasn't feeling love coming from the partner, I always say, oh, it's their problem. Their problem. There's this tendency to focus on their problem. Does that make sense? Rather than say and feel about God's not having a problem, so therefore, any issue I have with receiving love or giving it with God is about myself. Now, this is what I meant by if you seek first God's love, all these other things will be added to you. Right? Everything, including or everything within you, will be healed if you seek first that love. Now, the sexual side of things, or you could say the relationship side of things with a partner, is one way that you can help trigger some of these injuries you have with God. Now, my biggest problem with God is this side the receiving love from God. Now, for many of you, you might find that's the same issue for yourself. What, what feelings in you prevent you from receiving love from God? Unworthiness, a big one. A, a fear of rejection. 
like if I long for God and He doesn't want me, then who? Then how am I going to feel? A feeling that I'm nothing. Many of us have these feelings within us that I'm nothing, that I'm unworthy of God's attention, that I'm unworthy of anyone's attention, and all of those kind of things prevent receiving love. A feeling that you've done something wrong that God could never forgive is also a very, very powerful preventer for receiving love. And all of those feelings will be triggered if you develop your relationship with God. So now let's add the, the soulmate or a partner into the mix. So here's my partner's soul. What's her first priority? Develop the relationship with God. Right. Her first priority is develop a relationship with God. Her love of self will automatically grow, will it not? And your love of self will automatically grow too. As your love of self is growing, because you're receiving divine love, and as your love of self is growing, now you will no longer put up with unloving treatment from a partner. So this will help you, the relationship with God helps you develop this love of self. In the, in the pageant messages, there's a prayer that I gave to James Paget, And in that prayer, it talks all the way through it. If you read that prayer, you will see that all the way through it, there's all this stuff about unworthiness. <coughs> or in fact, if we use the flip side, I am worthy to receive God's love. There's lots and lots and lots of stuff about that in that prayer. My suggestion is to allow yourself to read that prayer and actually start feeling the feelings that you feel. Do you feel unworthy in your connection with God? Do you feel unworthy? How do you feel about yourself? Now, developing love of self is also a very big part of your sexuality. Because the, the majority of us don't like ourselves very much when it comes to our sexual desires. Because generally we've been taught to feel ashamed of them, that they're wanton, you know, and then we have all these terms, don't we? Oh, she's a slut, and he's a whatever. I don't know the male term for that. What's that? <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> a slut. It's so interesting, there's not many male terms for it. <laughs> don't you think? Don't you think? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's an injury there, obviously, right? So, We'll make a new word. What's the male word for it? So from now on we'll use the term slime bag or male. <laughs> So when, when, when we feel these emotions, like obviously, like for, for, many, for many women in particular, there's this multi-generational feelings towards women about, that men have, that are now a part of women's emotional development. There's these multi-generational emotions that men have that also have been from women about their emotional development. And obviously, there's a lot of sexual shame in this love of self area that we need to work through. And that's where being in a relationship can be very, very powerful to help you work through those particular emotions. In the end, what our aim is, is that we all have sexual power. Now, who doesn't like the word power? Oh, if you like the word power. <laughs> that's very good. Because in the end, when we love ourselves, we will be fully connected to our own sexual power. And when you're fully connected to your own sexual power, you never use your power unlovingly. So in a relationship, of course, you are quite fine with your power, and, that, and your partner will be quite fine with your power, but you'll never abuse the power of sex within the relationship. If we have a love of self, if we feel love of self, so love of self, focus on your relationship with God, that's going to develop your love of self quite markedly. Now, it will usually be your love of self that creates any friction between yourself and your partner. 
Now, most people would say it's actually the love of the partner that causes more friction, but actually it's the love of yourself that causes more friction. You see, if you loved yourself to a perfect degree, would you ever be unhappy about what your partner does? Would you? Like, let's say your partner went out and had sex with someone else. Would you feel hurt by your partner doing that? If you loved yourself. You see, what the reason why we feel hurt is because them doing it causes us this trigger of emotion <coughs> of they don't love me, which actually comes from a feeling of I don't really love myself, and so and so it goes. So can you see if I love myself perfectly, my partner will be able to do anything and I will still love myself. Of course, that doesn't mean I'll be with my partner. It just means that I'll still love myself. I won't be upset about what the partner has done. Does that make sense? I will just love myself in that transaction. That might mean not being with him or her, but I will still love myself and I won't be yelling and screaming and get saying, you did this to me and you did that to me and whatever else, just like I did last week. <laughs> Can we clarify that I didn't sleep with somebody else? Sorry? Can we clarify that I didn't sleep with somebody else? Yeah, <laughs> Mary, Mary wants to clarify she never slept with somebody else. Don't worry about it. If you love yourself, your law of attraction wouldn't have that happen to you. Right? Not necessarily. Um, for instance, uh, let's say, let's, let's put it back up to the spirit world type of scenario and then we'll put it back down into an earth type scenario. In the spirit world, I might be a celestial spirit and my partner might be in the first sphere. Now, do you think my partner loves me? If they're in the first sphere, how many lessons of love do they have to learn? Quite a lot, right? Do you think they love me? Nowhere near what I love me, <laughs> do they? If I'm in the celestial spheres, I'm already loving me completely. I'm loving me the same amount that God loves me in that state. And my partner's in the first sphere, do you think they love me? No. They don't love themselves either, do they? In that state, no. So they're not even capable of loving me to the degree that I love me. Right? Now in that situation, of course, you know, any transaction or interaction that goes on between us, I will be in a state where I love me more than my partner loves me. Yes, now we go to that spirit world I'm talking about here on earth. No different, no different. You see, the issue we often have here on earth is that often we don't trust our own feelings and we don't trust our own loves. So what, what often happens is we reduce the relationship to the lowest common denominator rather than the highest. Often that's the case. So what I mean by that is, let's say we were now, this celestial spirit and this first fair spirit were now in bodies on earth. They're not living in different locations, they're living in the same house. What does the first, how is the first fear spirit going to treat the, the person in the eighth? Unlovingly. You could say like, shit. Like, right? They're going to treat them badly, are they not? Because there is no development of love within them. Yet. Now, if I'm in the eighth sphere condition, Will that affect me? But you won't stay there. Yeah, you won't stay there. Yeah, because you see, the difference between the first sphere and the eighth sphere in the spirit world are what? Seven spheres. That's true, isn't it? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Right, so one of them's up here, one of them's down here. And whenever she or he um, feels like, hmm, this ain't loving, what can they do? They can go home. <laughs> and where's home? And can they get to them? Can't get anywhere near them, can they? So this person, whenever this person's unloving, can just say, I'm leaving. 
So my suggestion for a person who's in better condition of love than another person, rather than living together, have two separate houses. <laughs> so that you can go home when you're being treated unlovingly. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's practical. <laughs> someone, said it's, someone said it's not practical, but it's practical. And now, you see, it can help you <laughs> In the spirit world, every one of you have your own house. Your house is a complete reflection of your own soul condition. So any minor differences in soul condition means that you have like a different location. The only time that you actually live permanently together with the other person is if your soul condition is exactly the same. Now, obviously when we're beginning a relationship here on earth, particularly with our soulmate, our conditions are not going to be exactly the same. So living together is going to have its issues. Does that make sense? Because one of us is going to not be in the condition of love that the other one is. It's quite simple, really. Now, the key for this person is to never compromise love or truth or themselves for the person that's in a better condition. And by the way, that applies to both conditions. This person needs to never compromise love of themselves as well. But obviously this person doesn't know what love is to a large degree compared to that person. So what we need to do is work through that in a way, in an environment that's going to be conducive to enjoying the relationship. Now that may mean actually living in separate places. It may mean, you know, living in two different places in the same property. It may mean like some kind of separation when things get tough. When, when one of or both of you are feeling like you're not being loved so that you can work through the issues emotionally. Does that make sense? That will help things a lot. But if you're living together in the same location, then obviously love has to be the primary thing that you start working through. And if that isn't the primary thing, the only possible result is going to be your separation. Now, here on earth, there's a tendency to separate from a person and because of anger, make it permanent. You know what I mean by that? Like, you know, last week you upset me, I never want to see you again. <laughs> That's how it is, isn't it? Yeah. How many relationships have you had where you've never seen the person again? I've had a few where I've never seen them again. Why is that? One or both of us are uh, holding on to emotional issues, obviously, that would cause us to have that kind of separation. If, imagine for a moment, all of you were with your soulmate. Many of you think that that would be really, really good. <laughs> but the reality is that if your soulmate is in different condition to you, and they will be, it's very unlikely you'll be able to be in the same condition. You'll have all different sorts of injuries. Even if you're in the same condition of love, of natural love, you'll be in different conditions of erotic love, different conditions of love for others, different conditions of love for family. All sorts of things will be going on when you meet. If the key is to deal with those conditions in love, in truth, be open and honest. Now, if one can't do that, the other will need to leave. Will need to leave until the one who can't do it decides they want to do it. Because it, it is all about desire, is it not? It's all about passion and desire. So if I want to do it, I'll do it. It's just a matter of me staying connected with that emotionally and saying to myself, if I've got enough love of self, I will always protect that love of self and I'll always work through things about that love of self. And it's my relationship with God that's going to develop my love of self. Probably not my relationship with my partner. Does that make sense? Because my relationship with my partner might be such that they don't really love me. Or they don't care about me as much as I care about me. Because remember, when you're progressing on the path, you will eventually meet your soulmate. And if your soulmate's not on the path, they will be in a lesser condition than yourself, in love. 
And if they're in the lesser condition in love, you still want them, you still have a passionate desire for them, but they might not have a passionate desire for you. And what would that trigger? Emotions of rejection and unworthiness or any of those things you might have. If you develop all of that emotionally and get into a condition of love of self, then you will feel completely comfortable in that relationship except when love is being compromised. And as soon as love is being compromised, and I'm not talking about your love, I'm talking about God's love, as soon as that's compromised, you will leave the relationship until such time as it no longer is compromised. And then you'll go back. And then you'll leave, and then you'll go back until such time that you can be together. Do you think that's going to be a bit traumatic? Because it's totally different than what you're used to, isn't it? You're used to oh, falling in love and living happily ever after. And, and it's not like going to be like that initially because we've all got emotional injuries. So the sexual side of it is going to be very much reflecting the love side of it. So you have a hot and cold sexual relationship, guaranteed. Because while the love is flowing between the two of you, there will be strong sexual desire that's reflected by that love flowing. And then when certain injuries get exposed, what's going to happen is, oh, I don't really feel any sexual desire for you anymore. And then what we're used to doing again is saying to ourselves, oh, I don't feel sexual desire for this person anymore. I'll go and find someone else. But it's an emotional injury. Deal with the emotional injury and the sexual desire will return. Because right? sexual desire is totally dependent upon emotions, desires and passions. Question that Jen had. Uh, in defence of the soulmate relationship that you described as being <laughs> so traumatic, when the resistance does go between the two people, there is a, a magic to the yes. bond that's created. Very much that so. greatly surpasses anything I've ever experienced before yep. and could, could have ever imagined. Yes. So, so if there's the two halves, the problem that most soulmate halves when they first meet or during their relationship is that there is resistance towards each half. Now that might be because of different injuries. Like in mine and Mary's case, there are injuries that I had from the first injury that, of things that Mary did. There's injuries that Mary has towards me of things that I did in the first century. Right? In your case, for many of you, there'll be injuries that you have based around how your dad treated you, that you're now imposing upon all men that come into your life. There'll be injuries that you have surrounding how your, how your mother treated you that now is imposed upon all women coming into your life. Those injuries uh, are going to be there, but if you have a resistance to dealing with them emotionally, that's what creates the pain. If there's no resistance to dealing with it emotionally, there don't, doesn't need to be pain occurring during this process. Aside from the pain of the injury coming out of the soul, which is, by the way, always painful. That make sense? Uh. When you wrote the word slut on the Board, and then the next comment was, what will we call the man? And I yelled out, well, you know, he's always complimented. And you said, oh, you've got a problem. Um, I just stared at that word, and I do have a problem with it. Yep. Um, I've been sitting here trying to get it to flow, but I get stuck. Um, a long time ago, in my first marriage, we had our very first party at home, and... Um, I was always called the happy one, you know, always cheerful and everything, so I thought I was just being the perfect host and um, going around to each person and it was mostly just family and friends anyway. At the end of the night I'd had such a wonderful time, I sidled up to my husband and touched him on the chest and made goo goo eyes at him and, and said, you know, I'm ready to go to bed now and he said, get away from me, you slut. Because he told me that all I did all night was flirt with everybody and he was absolutely disgusted with me. And I spent the night in the car in the garage. Now I'm having problems 
squid. Was it my fault? Uh, did I do something wrong? Because I feel very guilty about it. And then that stops me flowing with my emotions because as soon as I start thinking about guilt, then I make it my fault. I mean, I'm willing to take on my part of the responsibility. Well, let's go into it, shall we? The law of attraction was at work that night. Why were you going around speaking to everyone? There was an emotion driving that. Because my husband didn't speak to me very much. He wasn't a very social person. Uh, that wasn't the emotion. What's the emotion you feel when you have people come around? Happy. No, there's an emotion underneath. <coughs> what do you want to do with those people? There's something you want to do for them. I want them to be happy? Yeah, you want them to be happy. You feel responsible for their happiness. You invite them into your house, and as soon as you invite them into their home, you now feel responsible for their happiness. <coughs> so that's number one emotion. You felt responsible for other people's happiness. Is that what you will feel when you're at one with God? No. So there's one emotion that's out of harmony with love that you certainly did. Does that make sense? So let's go with that first. Number one emotion was, I'm responsible for others. In, in acting out this responsibility emotion, your husband got triggered with another with an emotion. What did he feel? Insecure. Insecure. Jealous. Jealous. Yeah. What's under, under jealousy? Because we're talking about cause and emotions here. Rejection. 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 Rejection and unloved. That's what he felt. <coughs> Unbeknown to you. You were just acting out your responsible emotion. He's now acting out his rejection emotion. Is that, but he's not actually feeling the causal. He's blaming you. So what he did with that was he then projected, he didn't want to feel that emotion, so what he did was he projected anger at you. What did you feel when you had this anger projected? I was horrified. Yeah, underneath the horrified, it was because fear is devastated. Devastated, keep dropping. <laughs> Unwanted. Unloved. You can all help. Some, someone said unworthy. Let's let's feel a bit more about the unworthy side because I'm just all I'm doing is feeling your emotions. And get to the bottom of it. Can you feel there was a motion of, what did he say? You were a slut, is the words he used. Anger, and he used the word, you're a slut. How do you feel about the word slut? It's a horrible word. And why? Well, because it was a what does word it that only... What does it connotate? Um, bad people. But it's sexual shame, isn't it? It is. Sexual yeah. shame. Yeah, he, he said that to trigger your sexual shame. Does that make sense? That's what he triggered in you, wasn't it? Sexual shame. Well, he was the one that got me pregnant at 17. Yeah, but see, now you're going to be pregnant. which you didn't want to feel. And instead, you felt rejection instead, and you went out in the car and slept there in the, in the night. What did he feel after that? I have no idea. Yeah, you do. The next day, what was it like? He didn't talk to me for probably two days after that. Okay, so he was rejecting you now. So he's in this rage now with you. So what is he doing? He's punishing me. Yeah, he's trying to punish you for his own emotion that he doesn't want to feel. Uh, but there was something else he felt besides rejection and unloved. 
why would he use the term slut? Why wouldn't he just say, oh, you spent time with everybody else and no time with me? Because his mother never spent time with him. There's got to be something sexual in it for him. There's got to be something sexual in it for him. So, what did he feel sexually? Inadequate? Shame. Maybe shame itself, yeah. Maybe not. She looked like attractive to everybody. Well, I'm sure she would have done. You see, it's. A lot of men's jealousy is guided by the fact of what? Jealous. If, if I don't get all of their sexual attention, yeah. you know, all right, and then they go even one step further, if I don't get all their attention, then what do I, what does the man feel? Insecure. Impotent, insecure. insecure right? So there's a sexual unworthiness here, isn't there? Because if there wasn't sexual unworthiness, he wouldn't use the term slut, which is a sexual term, is it not? He would use to say, he would just say, you don't love me, or something like that. So if the injury that he had was more neutral in gender, he would have just said, oh, you don't love me, you don't care for me, right? Or you care more about other people than for me, which might be true. In that particular situation, it was true. When you feel responsible <coughs> for other people's emotions, you are caring more for them than yourself. And therefore, it's impossible for you to care for someone you love because you will rate the person you love at the same level as yourself, generally, in that situation. So the truth is, you were treating him unlovingly, but not with sexual unworthiness. You didn't go around and do all of these sexual things with all the people who went party, right? Which then would have, if, he, if you had done, it would make more sense for him to call you a slut under those circumstances, wouldn't it, with his injury? So can you see how, how a person speaks is a direct reflection of the injury that they're covering over with that speech? So what happened in the interaction in total, though, was he denied the experience of these emotions. He didn't want to have a good cry about these things within himself. You didn't want to feel these emotions. Right? You felt totally comfortable doing all of these things for these people. It brought you joy, is what how you see it. Does that make sense? In reality, it was based on an error because you want to please, right? But, but you, it brought you joy, in quotations, because it's not real joy. It's not real until it's done from <coughs> love. But that emotion triggered that emotion, which triggers this emotion. And can you see the interaction? One, one evening, quite a lot of causal emotion could have been addressed but wasn't because both did not want to feel what the causal emotion was. Does that make sense? Well, that was the history of our whole marriage. Exactly. You just described the history. It's the of history it. of most people's marriages, <laughs> not just yours. Yeah. Most people's relationships are based around these kind of injuries, back and forward, back and forward, back and forward. Remember, you attracted that person because your injuries match their injuries and can perfectly trigger each other. Now. Now, the problem with sex is that while my injury matches their injury, we can have a very, very fulfilling sexual life. Can you see why? If you can imagine it from a chakra point of view, if I've got this chakra closed, this chakra open, this chakra closed, and, and the person's got the opposite things occurring, energy is going to flow between us, isn't it? Right? It might be in a very haphazard way, but it's going to flow between us. And that's going to have the feeling, all of my sexual feelings will also rise, will it not? Right? So if I have an injury that I need a woman to be um, subservient, what am I going to attract? A subservient woman, probably, into my life. Right? And while she remains subservient, we're probably going to have a good sex life until the instant she realises I don't want to be subservient anymore. <laughs> and from that moment on, what's going to happen? <laughs> there, there'll be a disconnection sexually. You've got to say these things out loud. Don't you?
<laughs> because you see how there'll be a disconnection sexually. So a lot of times we'll be hoodwinked, if you like, initially via the sexual side of the relationship. We'll think that the sexual attraction means that this is our soulmate or something. In reality, most of the time we're sexually attracted to people that we have an in a sympathetic injury with. And I don't mean the same injury. It's a sympathetic injury, like the man who wants to dominate the woman, the woman wants to be dominated. A woman wants to dominate the man, the man wants to be dominated. They're going to have great sex life for a while. Until the domination gets overt or abusive, and then it's all going to close down. Does that make sense to everyone? Right. Um, Uh, just with your uh, soul partner and stuff like that, if one's in the uh, higher sphere mm -hmm. and the other one's in the lower sphere, is it going to dictate how far you're going to go in the spheres? Um, if, if you don't, the only place of a soul union is the transition between the 21st and 22nd spheres. So you will be able to get to the 21st sphere without a soul union. But you won't be able to get into the 22nd sphere without a soul union. But by that stage, usually, your soulmate's well and truly advanced, and if not advanced, then certainly, certainly probably in the celestial spheres anyway. Because the law of attraction works very powerfully when you get into a perfect state of love. Mm -hmm. Like, if I, if I was in a perfect state of love now, Mary would find it so much easier. And to... why are you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm speaking on behalf of everyone. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's so many things for me to work through still. Which um, I love about you, but I'm just curious on, on that. Yeah, the, the, the issue I'm facing is that um, a lot of my issues are very obscure and quite large in their nature. For example, um, like last week, for example, one of the emotions I worked through, which took me half a day to cry about, was I, I felt what it was like to give up perfection. And in, in the entire life here on Earth, the only person who's ever experienced perfection from birth to, to at one with God was myself. Now, now, for me, that was a part of me. Do you know what I mean? And in returning to this Earth, I had to give that up. I had to know, I knew in advance that I would become imperfect for the first time in my existence. In order to help us also? Yeah. Right. yeah. And, and I had a huge amount of grief associated with that. Now, I'd never intellectually considered that I would have that grief associated with that issue. And, but I forget what myself and Mary were talking about at the time. I just woke up one morning, we started yammering about something, and all of a sudden this emotion was triggered. And I spent a, a good part of the morning just crying about that emotion. And it was, a, it was a huge emotion to me. Now, a lot of my emotions are like that. They're very obscure and, and difficult to access without, um, without just allowing my feelings to flow. And so, so this, in the last two weeks, I've had huge numbers of those kind of emotions to deal with. And still, uh, like I said, I've been crying for a couple of weeks. I just got that, and I want to thank you for saying, sharing that with me, because it was important for me also. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. The, the, um, a lot of the issues that I've been facing are very, uh, even difficult for me to access, and I am pretty sensitive to people's emotions, including my own, but, but they are so obscure in nature that a lot of times I've gone for a few weeks or something like that before I can actually access an emotion. I know what it is, but I've got no way of accessing it. And this morning I was crying about, um, I'm trying to remember now, oh, I was crying that, that uh, it was an extension of an emotion I had Monday, on Monday, and that was that um, if you can just picture your life for a moment, that for 2,000 years you've been a certain person. So you have a certain identity, People know you uh, as a certain type of person, and they think they know you as well, by the way, without really knowing you, but for 2,000 years you've had an identity. And then one morning you wake up, and not a single person in your life remembers you. You remember all of that time, but not a single other person around, not a single person around you, including your own soulmate, remembers you. 
So that was another emotion that I worked through. And I haven't finished working through that. Um, just this terrible feeling of grief that, that I've lost me. And, and that I'm no longer the person everyone expects me to be as well. But there's this terrible feeling and sensation of grief associated with that. that um, and, and that emotion has taken me months and months and months to access. Like, I didn't know that until I just had this realisation that actually, um, like, this is what it feels like to me being here. It feels really surreal. It feels like everybody else is living in a different world than I am, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Because nobody really, nobody, like, to be honest and frank with you, none of you here really accept my existence as Jesus. Right? Yeah. I'm sorry, but I can feel the emotions. Now, now, there are different emotions you will work through to get into that condition. Some of you are in different states to that than others. So some of you feel quite certain that I probably am, but, but you still can't remember me as I was because I'm not as I was. Do you, do you know what I mean? We were existing back then. Well, no, there's many of you. Like, I've watched many of you get born. You don't understand, like, you know, I've been there when you were being born. Now, I've been there when you've been growing up. For many of you that are older than me, I knew you'd be here with me now. Do you know what I mean? Like, for, for you to understand what that feels like, and when I first met you, I already know you, but I know you don't know me. Do you know what I mean? It's like, you know us better. Well, it, it's, it, it's just all of these, it's like you having a, like for me, it's like me having an experience um, that that um, is very surreal for everyone else, and yet everyone else is like seeing something totally different than what I'm seeing. It's very hard to explain, but um, well, I well, <laughs> I don't know how. I see But the, the feeling I have is I just woke up one day and nobody knows me, and yet I know them, and and nobody knows who I was, can't remember me, can't even re like the 14 who are on earth today with me, very few, of them, very few of them can actually feel me. They very few of them have remembered me. Like I've remembered them, but they don't remember me. If you came in as a, a rabbi, would they have remembered? <laughs> no. no, I'm curious. Because the only way they would have remembered me is if I came in exactly as the perfect person exactly. I was when I left. Thank you. And so it was never going to be possible. Yeah. But, but that's why they don't remember me. Yeah. But it's, it, for me, it's just this terrible feeling of like all of my friends are gone. Not, not gone, they're there. They're sitting in front of me in many cases and they can't remember me. How did you feel? I've been crying about it for <laughs> quite a few weeks. Sad. Sorry? At least you don't have an analogy to the most. Oh, yeah, but they, are in the, they remember me from the spirit world. I can feel them. I can feel them remembering me because they are still in the spirit world and they can remember me. So this is where it gets very difficult for me because no one on earth remembers me, but, but everyone in the spirit world remembers me, particularly those people who were involved in my life in the first century. And so it gets very, very difficult to work through emotions like that for me. Yeah. And, 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 I just, and I do struggle with working through emotions like that. Um, and, and, and every one of them is so overwhelming uh, for me as well. So, and, and it's a similar sort of experience for Mary too, obviously. Every emotion she works through is very, very similar for her too. Like she remembers me as, as her husband. She doesn't remember me as Jesus. Like, I'm her husband that abandoned her by getting himself killed. Do you know what I mean? Like, that's how she remembers me. And she remembers we had children, had a child together. She remembers that she had to bring up that child alone. You know, she, she remembers all of those feelings about us. And so, so, you know, but she can't remember me as I am now because I'm not the person I was. Because I'm not perfected. She met me when I was perfect. Why was it not possible for you to come perfected? Not the way I wanted to come. Like, the truth is, we could have come perfected. 
we could have just materialised a human form and come down perfect. But would that have helped you very much? Yeah. It wouldn't have. It wouldn't have shown you how to deal with emotions. It wouldn't have shown you, through my own example, what to do. It wouldn't have gotten rid of all of these concepts that I'm some kind of God or whatever, you know, God's son and all this kind of stuff. It wouldn't have got rid of all of those concepts. In fact, if anything, it would have just made all of them worse, which is the opposite of what I want to do. So, so the way we saw it is we had to come this way, but of course there's problems associated with it, of which I'm keenly aware. Yeah. So some at the back there was um, right up the back in the corner there. What level are you at at the moment? What level am I at? Yeah. <laughs> what level do I think I'm at? <laughs> or what level am I at? What do you, do you feel that you're at? Uh, today I'm in one. <laughs> Every day is different. Oh, okay. It's not like a... Well, you know, the emotions I'm working through today, I've had some anger today. And you know, I've had lots of grief today to work through. Um, so in terms of my soul condition, obviously it's going to vary from moment to moment. To, where I could be in the spirit world is going to vary from moment to moment depending on the emotion I'm working through at the time. But, um, and, and lots of people ask me where I'm at and where they're at, and I tend to avoid the answer uh, for obvious reasons. Um, firstly, if, if you talk about where you're at, a lot of people start saying, well, you know, how long you've been there? Uh, well, in one of the spheres I was in, I was there for three years dealing with emotions. So how many of you have, since you started this path, have dealt with emotions every single day, cried absolutely every single day for three years? If you can picture that, that's where I was in one sphere dealing with stuff, right? Now, that's been quite a regular occurrence for me during the last 12 years, where I've stayed stuck in a place, not working through something and working through all these different facets of emotions for a period of time. And so, so now, while I think I'm in a certain, certain location, and I, and I know I'm very close to the end of this traumatic part of my own development, um, they're still, like, because I'm near the end of the traumatic part, the emotions are the most traumatic. So, so I'm feeling lots of traumatised emotions at the moment. Lots of stuff to do with, like, abuse and, and, and uh, torture and, and also a lot of these other bigger picture things, you know, about identity, role, you know, what God's planned for me in the future. Do I want to actually embrace that, you know, all of those kind of things. Um, where's the mic? Um, it's very superfluous now because you've covered it. You know, in your teachings at other times, I've read what you said, in, in the end you will even have to forgive me. And I wasn't fond of that, so I that and thought, why would I need to forgive you? And I realised when you were talking, it's the perfection. Yeah, it's a, like like many most people's problem with me at the moment is that I'm not perfect. That's why they can't believe I'm who I say I am. Because most people know that I'm not perfect. They can see my imperfections, and then their natural assumption is, well, he's not Jesus then. It's idolatry. It's thinking I'm not here and we are not. But in the first century, I was perfect, and there's the, so there's this automatic assumption that I, if I returned, I would be. Does that make sense? Judgment. There's a judgment uh, about that, and and yeah, you need to forgive me for that. Sorry. Was it, was it perfect, <laughs> sorry, AJ. Was it perfect from their standpoint of view when you made that comment? No, it was perfect from God's standpoint. Oh, okay. Because um, I was at one with God yeah, yes. in the past. And, but for many people on earth in the first century, they felt I was the perfect man. Yeah. Yeah. And now, obviously, that's not the case. <laughs> right? Very few people feel that. So, so, and because of that, there's a lot of judgment about that. That, oh, he can't be the Jesus we know, or we, that's in the Bible, because he'd be this. You know, not understanding the whole picture, but, but uh, assuming that he'd be a certain thing. 
And so, like, I've, the, one, some of the big projections that I've had to deal with from people is this constant projection that I get from everyone, he's not Jesus because. Mm. He's not Jesus because of this or because of that or because three years ago he said this and it hasn't come true or whatever. Bearing in mind this the entire time I said I'm not perfect and my feelings will change as I'm growing. The entire time I've said that. But people forget that and they expect the perfection. I just want to say that I You're very, very upset. upset. Very upset. Yeah. And about five minutes into the DVD, there was the depth of the vulnerability and honesty. Sorry, I couldn't hear those comments. It was the depth of the vulnerability and honesty. Yeah. And I may not know perfectly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. For many of you, you feel the same. I can do that. Yes. And, and honestly, you are the easiest audience now, like, <laughs> compared to what we recently experienced, um, like, most audiences we go to are still heavily doubt, he heavy in doubt, heavy in anger many times, and so, because many of you have been coming quite regularly, working through emotions as you clear away emotions, you can feel another person's emotions more, yeah. so you're able to feel my emotions more. Uh, but many audiences are not like that. Many audiences are very antagonistic and angry and upset still with me. If I can go back to De Dennis. No, oh, yeah, yes. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and Jen. You could do it, Jane, taking one of us with you. Yeah. <laughs> You're all welcome to come in any trip you have. The next trip, by the way, would probably be, there's a group of people in Mackay that are saving up money to fly us there. So when they've done that, probably that'll be our next trip if you're interested in going to Mackay. But uh, yeah, you're all welcome to come wherever I go, including around the world if you want to. <laughs> um, but the, uh, the issue for me is that this is part of my time for dealing with those emotions. Like I do need to get into condition where no matter what is hammered at me, that I am in a state of love that I can deal with anything. And uh, the truth is at the moment, when I get hammered, I have some really lower, bad lower back pain, which is all unworthy feelings that come up all the time. And that is what I'm working through and have been working through for some time now. And there's so many different facets to it, that, and I'm hoping that soon it will be complete. But, but at the moment, and there's still so many facets left within me that I need to work through. Right. Along those lines, AJ, as we unfold on our journey and as we deal more with our injuries, does that help you? Um, yeah, it, when I started doing this, it, it felt like the world was a lead weight hanging onto my feet. Um, but that's the only way I can describe it emotionally. So every new bit of progression that I made, it felt like someone was just hanging onto my feet trying to prevent me from making it. What's happened in the last year is that so many of you have taken up your emotional journey and you've taken up this journey towards God as well. So many of you have. And there's been a lot of spirits that have as well. And as a result of that, it certainly has this effect of encouraging me. Um, and, and although at the time that's not probably your, your idea that you could encourage me, but that's the way I feel, I feel the deep feeling of encouragement of seeing people making changes and so forth. That being said, there's a lot of spirits at the moment in the spirit world who are very angry with me. And so many of you will be feeling quite strong attacks by being associated with me. So, so some of you may feel that some of your life has gotten a bit difficult lately because you've known me and because you know about this part. And a lot of that is due to some spirits who are trying to destroy me through you, if that makes sense. Um, so there's even been ones in the audience who have been encouraged to kill me and so forth. And I've told, they've talked to me about it. Um, so there are times when different mediumistic people in the audience have actually been encouraged to kill me, um, to, to get rid of me, by these spirits who, who um, 
who are quite angry with me. So I get a lot of that as well, but that just triggers more of this unworthiness feeling, which I need to work through. So, so that's why I'm just, um, my biggest issue is the unworthy feeling. Uh, that's still my biggest issue. It's been my biggest issue for five years. And there's been hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of different emotions I've processed related to it. But uh, I'm, I feel like I'm getting to the core of it now. But it certainly helps me greatly by seeing you do your work. Yeah. What, what's the point in me talking about it if nobody does it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. but, I don't, but I don't mean by that that I'm reliant on you doing it. Right? But it is so lovely to see you doing it. It's really encouraging. and It makes myself and Mary feel... Mary even feels more encouraged perhaps than I do at times by seeing you <coughs> work through things as you do. Jen? Oh, sorry. I said down the front here first and then, and then Jen. Sorry. I just wanted to share a comment with you and just to say thank you for what you said before about knowing us. When I first came here in December, I sat there for the, the whole time of the fight back. I was just with this feeling, thinking, do you know me? And it just touched me so much before when you said that, that you do know me. Yeah. And I just wanted to, you know, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Like, most of you, I've seen you being born, I've seen you grow up. You know, <coughs> just, I've, se I've seen your heart, you know, like the desire you have for truth, which is really attractive to me, um, and the desire you have for love that's really attractive to me. So I've seen those things for most of your life, you know, and I've seen the pain and suffering that many of you have experienced as a result of not having the truth in your life. And, and so, you know, it's very important to me um, that I can meet you now and talk to you about how to have those things, you know. Um, and it's, it's such a powerful thing to, to meet you at last, you know, face to face. Many of us have met years ago in the spirit world, or in, in your sleep state, and it's only through opportunities and circumstances that we've come to meet in the awake state. Many of you have had time after time after time where you've heard about me or heard about some of the teachings but not followed them or heard about it and been sort of repelled by something I've said and gone away for a while and and honestly I feel that all of you are going to progress on the divine path now whether you like it or not. <laughs> um, because, because down the track, whatever happens now, down the track you'll remember these occasions. So that's, that's really great too, I think. Yeah. Uh, Jen, thanks. Um, I've become very aware over the last, I don't know, what we call the break, that there were hundreds of thousands of spirits here, some of them in very troubled condition, but very recently, as you started to share about your own personal journey, some of the high realms opened up and they begin to rejoice and sing and I can feel it. Yeah. Right down at my soul. When you share about who you are, when you show your courage and the depth of emotion that you feel for us. So it's not just us that are privileged in this audience, it's like, and I know you know, but I'm not sure other people understand the depth and the breadth of how far you're sharing and your journey and our journey can actually has the potential to reach. Yeah. Um, my spirit friends in the spirit world have been waiting a long time for me to talk openly about who I am. And uh, <laughs> um, one of the, you know, they feel whenever I do that it's a major, major thing for me, which it is. And, um, and they feel things are getting closer when I do that. Like, and uh, so I feel a lot of their love and concern when, when I do that. But, um, you know, the other spirits who are here with us, there are literally now close to a million spirits rocking up at these events. So um, at any one time that we have an event like this, like next week we're having an event in Brisbane, which is the one about anger, like anger being your guide. And, and I'm very certain that over a few million spirits are going to be there. Many of them in an angry place. 
which will be interesting in itself, <laughs> right? Because there, there's literally huge numbers of spirits now coming along to these events. And that's why you feel the energy change so markedly during a talk. Sometimes you can feel a real depressed feeling, real creep in, you know, when I... You remember the talk I did about law of compensation? And how oh, everyone, everyone got really heavy, all of you wanted to go to sleep. And you remember that? And then when I just said that, everything just brightened up straight away. Well, that, that was all of those spirits who felt dragged down even further and further and further by this law of compensation that they were experiencing. And then when we started talking about the divine love path and how they could progress rapidly, lots and lots of them progressed as a result of that. So this is happening all the time. Every single discussion, every single discussion you have with another person, there are actually lots and lots of spirits surrounding you now, you know, of all various conditions. And if you're sensitive to them, you will feel them. And, uh, and that's all having a huge effect and change. Unfortunately, there's a group of very, very, very dark spirits who can see that the way the world's going to change is through this. And they are very, very intent on harming you. Um, and I'm sorry about that. I've had many, I've had many cries about that, um, feeling responsible for you, which I shouldn't feel. <laughs> um, but it's one of my emotions uh, of feeling responsible for other people's pain, and, and it comes again from the fir my first century life, where you know after I died, the the movement that began through my work and was tortured terribly. Um, and it grew, it, it grew, it continued to grow, but over the centuries, literally billions of people have died because they knew me. So that's been a big emotion for me to deal with. Like, imagine that because somebody knew you, like, they died. And imagine that there's a billion people like that, like, who knew you and they died because of knowing you. And so that, that's a big emotion for me that, that I've had to work through and I'm still working through that as well. So there's a lot of emotions I'm still working through and I'm sorry if it seems like I'm a bit slow, but um, that's just... <laughs> <laughs> that's great, isn't it? <laughs> it's, it's, AJ, can I ask you another question on the Sure, sure. They came before the break. Their issue is, is that they connect through various people in a sexual nature. Yes. And they sexually exploit those through people. possession, yep. through looking into people as a result of emotions. Yep. They asked me to ask, what do they now do? You're telling you're telling them that love and sex belong together, yet they are disconnected from their loving nature. Exactly. They're disconnected and don't know where to turn and know, know in a realisation that hooking into people and living out sexual experiences through people on earth is now an incorrect choice. Yes. All right, let, let me explain for the rest of the audience what, <coughs> what they actually have been doing. What they've been doing is, if you imagine there's people on earth, so we've got people on earth, males and females on earth, You've got these spirits, and most of the, all of these spirits are in the first sphere generally, right? So, and, and when I say generally, all of them are in the first sphere. These spirits tee up sexual encounters on Earth, and actually, actually through their spirit bodies, influence the sexual organs of the people during these encounters, in order to feel gratified sexually themselves. <coughs> And that's what they've been doing. Now, there are literally billions of spirits doing this. It's a huge problem in the spirit world. There are billions of spirits doing it. The reason why is that many of them pass from the spirit world, so from Earth into the spirit world. Many of them pass because of their own sexual desires in a first sphere or in one of the hells of the first sphere condition. What happens when they're in that condition is they then, obviously in that condition there's not many attractive people around you. Can you understand that? Like, most people are very ugly, deformed, in that 
lower health, hemisphere condition. <coughs> so they feel very attracted back to the earth to get what they want from people on the earth. And so what they do, and because they can't have these sexual interactions where they are, they, can, they have a lot of trouble even feeling their own emotions where they are, let alone having a sexual experience. What they do is they visit the earth and look for people on earth who have issues to do related to sex, but issues with power or a lack of power sexually. Most of it's those kind of emotions. There are lots of emotions, by the way, through which a spirit can connect to you sexually, but they are the dominant ones. So what they then do is they influence a sexual transaction with two people on earth. Some of them even just connect with the person while the person might be masturbating or something like that, and they actually heighten the sexual experience of the person on earth, which causes the person on earth to be addicted to the spirit's influence. Mm. So you imagine for a moment if you've never really had a really good sexual connection with somebody on earth, and then all of a sudden you have this huge sexual response to somebody on earth. And all of a sudden you know or feel that there was a third person involved but they weren't with you. You're going to become very addicted to that experience if you don't deal with the issue that's of the attraction. And so these spirits are influencing these people on earth, like literally by the millions, influencing lots and lots of sexual transactions. Unfortunately, many tantric sexual experiences are like this. Right? So I'm not decrying tantric sex just like any other thing, but often because many tantric sexual experiences have a group of people, and I'm not talking about it in a purest sense, I'm talking about it where it's exploited for sexuality. There are many tantric sexual experiences now where groups of people just strip off and have sex with each other or, and supposedly learn techniques through this. But often it's the spirit's influence that causes them to know a technique. And the spirits are heavily involved in those kind of transactions many times. So, so these spirits that have contacted Jen are in that state in the spirit world and they've now had the realisation that they're harming people on earth and they're actually harming themselves. They also have a realisation they're just doing it for sexual feelings and they're not doing it because they love somebody. So they can feel this big separation between sex and love. Now my suggestion to them is the same as my suggestion to other spirits that are here for other reasons and that is there are some brighter spirits with them who have been waiting for them to get into a state of realisation for them to ask those brighter spirits to come to them and now talk to them about what God's view is about what they're doing but also talk to them about what the emotions are within them that cause them to want to do this and if they can listen to those spirits because those spirits will be able to talk to them very rapidly much more than I would be able to and then they'll be able to work through those issues so my at the moment they don't feel very trusting of those spirits they also feel at the moment that if they give up this sexuality, they'll have no sex. And, and the issue is that, you know, the truth is that for a little while they may have no sex. But once they work through the emotional issues, they will be able to enter into sexual encounters in the spirit world with people who know what they're doing rather than people on earth who have no idea what's going on. So my suggestion for them is to allow themselves to work through those emotional issues so that they can have a real sexual encounter with somebody in the spirit world rather than a sexual encounter that's abusive with somebody on the earth. Is there a mic? Mic something? You were saying before about the uh, 20 second sphere that you have to be in union to pass through it. Yep. So does that mean you're con you are constantly in a form of sexual activity? Yes, you're in constant sexual union. That's great, eh? <laughs> that always appeals to a young man. <laughs> oh, God.
remember that, that halves of the soul, oh, I've drawn them all the way around here, but anyway, you get the idea. As you progress towards God, you're progressing towards each other. But you're progressing towards each other in every sense. So every emotion that passes through you will pass through your soulmate. Now, to give you an example of that, when I was on the stake um, in the first century when I was dying, every single thing that happened to me, because my soulmate was connected to me, because Mary was connected to me emotionally, she wasn't, we weren't at one with each other, but we were connected emotionally so much that every sing th single thing that happened to me, she felt. Physically. Physically. So she actually felt every pain that I was feeling mm -hmm. as I was going through it. It's one of the draw. Same reverse. Sorry? Same reverse. Yeah. yeah. Now, because I didn't have emotional injuries, these feelings could pass through me unimpeded, which meant I didn't feel much pain from them. But because Mary still had some emotional injuries, when they passed through her, they caused her tremendous pain. So Mary actually felt more pain from that experience than I did. That's one of the drawbacks in soul, <laughs> soul that experience. But if, if you can just picture that place in, a, in, in with good emotions for a moment. So you just imagine that every powerful emotional experience that you have, the person you're with actually feels it pass through them as it's passing through you. Imagine how wonderful that would be. Like it's a, it's a very strong feeling of being to the, together completely. And as you're working towards it one moment with God, and then you get to it one moment with your soulmate, in the end that's what's happening with all of the emotion. So not just the sexual emotions, but all of the emotions, all of the desires, all of the passions are flowing through you and being amplified by each of you. It's an amazingly creative space to, to be in. That's where you create universes, and you will create universes in that space. And every time you ask a question, Karen, I can feel this intellect, this powerful intellect of yours, <laughs> kicking into gear. Just let yourself breathe for a moment and feel. Imagine, just imagine a picture. Imagine a picture, there's God somewhere out there. You can't picture God, but let's just imagine God like that. Here's you, female part of the soul. <coughs> For God's love to enter you, what do you need? A pure soul. Desire. desire. Not a pure soul. Don't need a pure soul. Desire. You need desire. Desire for God's love to enter you. Pure desire. And what else do you need? Desire for God's truth. Desire for God's truth. So you need to be in a condition of emotional truth. Not intellectual truth. Not intellectual truth. Emotional truth. Right? So many of us think we can get into a condition of intellectual truth and then we're there. We're nowhere near there. It's emotional truth that we have to be in a condition of, to be there. So, if I have a desire for God's love, to experience God's love, and I have a desire for God's truth, emotionally, emotional, I want it to be the emotional truth. I need to face my own emotional truth. Once those two things happen, God's love will automatically flow. As God's love flows, my own sense of worthiness automatically grows. Can you see why? Because now God is loving me and I feel <coughs> God's love. So while at the start, so for many of the spirits that are with us here today, they've got no concept of love. All they feel is this feeling they have to be all they need to do is feel that feeling and allow that to grow into a desire for God's love to enter them. Many of them don't even believe in God. So all I ask them to do is just imagine there's a God. And imagine if there is a God that she loves you. And all you need to do to receive this love is just to allow yourself to long for it. Allow yourself to want it. That's all you need. Nothing else. And as that happens, 
the truth and your own sense of worthiness will automatically grow. The worthiness isn't dependent... Like, you can be in a terrible, unworthy state and receive this love. But the worthiness will grow, and as the worthiness grows, your desire for the love will grow. And as the desire for the love grows, so does the love flowing through you. And that's how it works. You'll get into a state of a one with God like that. You don't need to understand anything intellectually to do that. It's just a feeling inside of you. That's all. That's very true. The way you see God is generally the way you see your parents. But, like, what do you want to do? Do you want to work through every single emotion with your parents before you actually develop a longing for God? Or would you like to just develop a longing for God now, start receiving God's love and allow these other emotions just to be triggered along the way? Can you see the difference? Like, many of us are saying, oh, I've got to do with this parent thing, oh, I've got to do with that thing, oh, I've got to do with that thing. When a lot of times all we need to do is have a really passionate desiring longing for God and trust that God loves you like have some faith that God loves you right and then as you receive that these emotions other emotions will automatically just get triggered one after the other after the other many of you have experienced this right where you've had the emotion oh wow well, is that one oh, you know away you go and, oh I had that one oh, away I go. And, and these things get triggered right the key is to allow the emotions to flow. You don't have to understand what's happening so much as just let it happen and allow the desire for God to happen. Does that make sense? Like, like many times I just sit down and all I do is allow myself to say, read a pageant message and just feel while I'm reading it. And most of the time I feel a longing for God in that process. And most of the time while I'm receiving my love, I have a cry. And then most of the time after I have a cry, I realise, oh, that's what that was about. And for many of you, that's already happening too. And that's all that needs to happen. Does that make sense? Okay. Try to get the intellect out of the way. I oh, know. You've just got a powerful intellect in it. It's getting in the way. Um, And can I just wanted to know if you've got any recommendations for birth control while I'm going to have all this business? Sure, sure. <laughs> Don't have any. <laughs> <laughs> no, just, uh, that was just... Birth control. <laughs> Take care of using any birth control that terminates a pregnancy. Because terminating a pregnancy is terminating an already incarnated soul. So you take a lot of care with that. Does that mean the morning after pill? The morning after pill is one of those things. Yeah. Right. Being so, on the pill itself. <laughs> and well, let's look at being on the pill. When you're at one with God, for a start, you will not need to take any pills. And you will get to a point in your own progression with the pill that you'll realise that the pill is actually modifying you inside and your own love of self will prevent you from taking it. That's why I asked because I couldn't take the pill. Yeah. Now, now, there's a lot of people who start on the progression on the path. It's probably... I should start writing a few warnings. Warning. <laughs> you may want to go off the and usually what happens on the path is that people get to a certain level in their love of self and they realise that the, the birth, the pill, is modifying their own, their, their own response, their own emotional response. And, uh, and so many people at that point start feeling like, oh, I don't feel like taking this anymore. You need to, on the path, you need to trust your feelings. Many times lately when I've been talking to different people, I've been always saying, well, what do you feel? And they said, well, I don't want to know. I can tell you what I feel, but I want to know what you think. No, I said, I don't want to tell you. What do you feel? Because you need to start trusting what you feel. So, same goes with birth control. You need to start trusting what you feel. Now, and 
when you get it to an abundant condition, you will be able to control any birth. When I say control, you won't have a child unless you really want one. Right? You just won't get pregnant. A male can also control whether sperm gets released or not. Right? Those things can happen automatically too. Right? Now, now, before that time, obviously, we're just working with the imperfection. <coughs> and my only guideline would be don't do something that breaks a law of love. So a law of love would be if I'm terminating a pregnancy, I'm actually breaking a law of love. <coughs> so using a condom? Using a condom. Doesn't feel right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and withdrawal seems okay with then that sort of not um, not fulfilling. Yeah. So, and I'm kind of. An oral sex is great, <laughs> <laughs> but it's boring all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so, what does that leave us with? <laughs> Other than abstaining from sex. Yeah. yeah. Never abstain. <laughs> abstaining is not a good thing. And that's something that I that is like I feel is to do with everyone's conscience, what you do. And in time what will happen is, so during this time when you're progressing, what's really happening is we're just making do until we get to a point where we've got the real thing. You know what I mean? Now, during that period, it's really up to you what you choose to do. And my suggestion is to, to choose things that are harmonious firstly with love of any unborn child. That's a really important issue. The second thing then is to choose what's in harmony with love of yourself. Right? That's really important. The third thing is to start looking at why we don't want to have children. Like for many of us, we don't want to have children, right? Particularly every time you have sex, you don't want to have children. <laughs> so, otherwise you end up with 25. <laughs> and the reason why that is, is firstly, there's a lot of emotions going on with regard to having children. And what we need to do is allow ourselves to start feeling about the emotions as to why we want to prevent the process. And because when you get to a point where you actually have completely worked through all of your emotions, the irony is then you will be able to completely prevent the process if you want to. And you will only want to have children under certain conditions generally. Up until that point in time, um, my suggestion is just to investigate those forms of birth control that are the least uh, have the least impact on you at the emotional level. And I say the emotional level because you don't want to take something that shuts you down emotionally with regard to sexuality or with regard to your own internal organs. And um, a lot of those kind of shutting things down uh, are due to emotions within yourself. So allow yourself to investigate all forms and choose whatever is comfortable with yourself. For many of you, you're finding that not much is comfortable. <laughs> and, uh, and there's a reason for that, and that is that in our perfect state, we are totally able to control the whole process. And that's where we're headed. So all of the prophylactic businesses will go out of business eventually. But at the moment, and obviously there's a need for them for lots of reasons. Um, so. And this is the issue with, uh, with most of the things we face is on earth, not just sex. We often, like, how many of you still take a headache pill when you've got a headache? Okay. And some do that still, yeah. Right? And that, and that you know, that there's this automatic desire, isn't there, to try to shut down something that's painful. Do you know what I mean? <coughs> that happens usually automatically with us. And so we search for these things all the time. But the reality is that the headache is a result of a suppression of an emotion, yeah. and usually a grief-based emotion, that we need to really allow ourselves to feel. When you feel it, your headache will instantly disappear anyway. So after a while, we'll get used to this idea that we won't need these things. But during the period in between, do what is the most comfortable to you, but also make sure it's harmonious with love. And that's really the only guideline. So I haven't, I haven't got an automatic cure. Like um, Luke and Sarah, my daughter and son, in the first century, um, what happened with them, uh, they decided to use sheep gut as a, as a condom. 
Because uh, obviously, you know, back then you would slaughter your own animals to eat meat, and that's what they did. Until their daughter grew up and was about six years of age, and the daughter had major problems with the meat and meat. So they finished up having two more sons. <laughs> they, had no more, they had no more way of, uh, of uh, stopping pregnancy. But historically, that's what's happened. There's been all sorts of methods of birth control, but uh, use the ones that are the most satisfying and fulfilling emotion. <coughs> And um, behind you. Hey, Jay, I was just wondering what sort of damage do you do to the child if you take them all out? I took one with my daughter. <laughs> they pass, obviously. And you've caused the passing of the child, basically. But my second daughter is actually alive. Oh, all right. Yeah. And um, so it didn't work. <laughs> oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no. Um, the damage is emotional. And the damage is a feeling that they have that they're not wanted. And you'll probably find that in your daughter. She has this feeling that she wasn't wanted. The key, the key now is to, you'll need to allow her to grieve that emotion and release it. When she releases it, your love for her, she'll start feeling. But at the moment, she's struggling to feel your love for her because she feels she wasn't wanted. And that's the damage you do through that action. So if, if you actually take an action, uh, the intent of the action is what's impressed on the child, not the result of the action. So the child will feel that emotion, even if it, if it had passed at the time you took the morning after pill, she would have felt that same emotion. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. The key for you is to allow yourself to grieve the fact that you desired to get rid of her at that time. Allow yourself to grieve that and, uh, and pray to God about that. Allow, you know, allow yourself to feel those emotions. And when you do, you'll feel a sense of relief and you'll feel forgiveness. You'll feel the feeling of forgiveness, if you like, pass through you in peace. And when that happens, that will probably be the time your daughter wants to have a big cry about you not wanting her. So allow, herself, allow, allow her to go through that as well. Yeah. And then you'll have a much closer relationship. Yeah. You, you desire a closer relationship, but she's... But I think it's, it also reflects the feeling that I have not been so that was the second word question is, is, did I do that because I have that feeling? Yes. Most abortions are caused by the mother or the father or both having a feeling that they weren't wanted themselves and they don't want to bring a child into the world that's yeah. not wanted. The truth is that that child is feeling that emotion at that point anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, yeah, it, it's sad, but most of the abortion type of emotions, the emotions that cause us to abort a child, are actually the emotions that we ourselves are feeling from our own child. Yeah. The key is to go into that and experience those emotions. Yeah. We got a bit off the subject of sex, but that's okay. <laughs> how much truth is there in the theory that a man shouldn't ejaculate all the time and that the sperm is actually a most of these theories are based around the dominance of the physical body and the emotional body, which is the spirit body. So very few of these theories are based around what's happening at the soul level, for a start. It is true that there is energy going out when the man ejaculates. And, but there's energy going out when he runs too. And there's energy going out, do you know what I mean? Like there's all sorts of energy going out all the time. And a lot of, it seems sometimes that um, Yes, the man can certainly orgasm without ejaculation. As a technique, it's a very good birth control technique. However, with the proviso, that most men leak semen while, during intercourse anyway before they ejaculate. So therefore, there's a high likelihood you still could become pregnant anyway. But they, they do it for the sake of having orgasm after orgasm without ejaculation. And there's nothing wrong with that. But if you're doing that just as a technique in order to do something for your partner and you're not doing it out of love, then you're not going to experience a soul connection during the process. Does, does that make sense? It's the soul connection during the process that will enhance your lovemaking experience. And when you've got a perfect soul connection, all sexual connection between you will be orgasmic anyway. So 
the the issue is more there's a lot of I suppose what concerns me is a little nowadays is there's a lot of techniques that are used in new age philosophies and sexual philosophies and so forth. There's a lot of techniques which can certainly bring you pleasure, but often there's a big then a big focus on the technique, and that is not like like in the end when you're at one with God, you won't be focusing on any technique you'll just be automatically doing it without trying. And a focus on the technique detunes you a lot of times from what's going on emotionally. So there's a balance. Between, I suppose there's a, what I'm saying is there's a balance between those two points. So there's no harm in le learning a technique like for a male, how to, how, to, how to orgasm without ejaculation. There's no harm in learning those techniques. In fact, there's a lot of joy you can get from learning those techniques. But if it becomes technique for the sake of the technique, right, then it's out of harmony with love. And it's not going to be to your long-term benefit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sorry? Um, keep your hand up. Contraception? Or just how to because I feel I still feel very it's really unloving to bring a child into this world of error. And when like you're saying like condoms not good because it's not gonna feel good. Um, the other oh, ones, no, that, that's I'm just reflecting the personal opinions of yeah, me yeah, and yeah, the yeah. audience. <laughs> but I'll probably stick with that one. But um, I don't know, I had a had a dream a couple of weeks back. My dreams get really funny, and uh, the, in the dream, I had a child. Well, I didn't have a child, <laughs> but um, this little girl came up to me and started saying all this stuff. And um, basically, I just got the feeling that uh, some time ago, when I was with a girlfriend, quite young, and. Uh, took the morning after the pill that may have killed someone. Yeah. And um, I guess the question is, like, you know, I want to know if that's real. And uh, What did you feel? I don't know. No, it is real. It is real. And I, I look after kids. That's my job. And at the moment, I just realized, had the realization that that little girl maybe connected with a lot of the children that I spend a lot of my time with. A lot of times what happens with a child who's been aborted and passes in a spirit world, if there's a love connection with one or both of the parents, what will happen is that child will spend a lot of time on earth playing with other children who are actually physically on earth around that person. So, so you'll get things like, um, uh, many of you ladies who have had miscarriages, but have had other children. Your miscarried children spend a bit of time on earth playing with the other children. Sometimes you'll notice that if you have an animal around, the animal will just start barking or carrying on and like, you, the, the spirit's playing with the animal. Does that make sense? Like, so a lot of times that's actually happening, this interaction between the spirit world and earth is happening. At, and in the case, in, in your case, yes, there was a child uh, conceived which was aborted and because of both parents not really being understanding what's going on there's still a feeling of love coming uh, to that child from you both and so that child occasionally spends time with you and and his mother um, both in the sleep state and on it 
And so often, that if you're in a place where you've, there's other children, they will often be playing in an environment with other children. So, so they interact with them as best they can. And many of your children, some of you are quite, some of your children are quite mediumistic, and you will notice them at times playing with imaginary friends, or and they're actually playing with spirit children who have passed. Thanks. So for quite some time also there have been members of my family here, um, several generations that, are, that lead me to ask this question. There is a, um, a belief of incest as being acceptable in our family Yes. that has passed down uh, many generations. In my father's life um, he was taught by his mother that it was an acceptable form to take sexually from his sisters during the wartime. Um, and then that passed down um, into my relationship with my father and into my relationship with my sons. Yeah. The question is, is with the spirits that are here that are now past, they ask now, how do they then repair the belief system that they somewhat innocently accepted as being an acceptable form of expression having a disconnection between sex and love and survival and it got it um there's like great grandparents here on both sides of the family yeah it, it's very um, they're very distressed yeah did, at, the realize, at this realization that that um, real expressions of love were possible, but they believed something that was in error, taught to them by their parents, and it's pervasive. It's just down. Yeah. Well, first, firstly, they they are not being honest with themselves completely for a start. Firstly, each each one of them has an emotion within them that I can feel in them of of shame about these sexual encounters. So the truth is that they that they didn't just accept it like as an acceptable form of sexual interaction. They accepted it with shame. And this is why it was hidden quite a lot in the family. Right? So so the first thing they need to do is allow themselves to feel that shame. Because if they had felt that shame in the first instance, they would never have perpetrated the crime on the subsequent generations. The second thing they need to do is start praying to God about the emotional reason within themselves that they can re that that is the cause of their desire to do this. So they need to allow themselves to have a longing with God to work through that particular issue. When they do that, it automatically releases the burden from the people still alive on earth about the issue. Does that make sense? But the people alive still on earth will still have some emotion to work through about the issue. Uh, and the reason why is that many of their children are obviously now adults and will need to work through the issue as well. But they can do lots to actually help that process occur. But they are still in a state of fooling themselves to a degree of how bad and how damaging it has been. And they need to feel the full effects of that and pray to God about that. When they pray to God about that, they will feel God's love enter them when they are in a state of complete repentance. And they will feel that they've been forgiven at that moment. Does that make sense to them? When they feel that forgiveness, they'll know that they've dealt with the emotion, that they've actually felt it fully. I can feel a sense of turmoil yeah. going on around. Yeah, they're very, they're very stressed because um, they don't want to believe that it has damaged people so much. There's this still this strong uh, sense within them that they were doing the right thing or that they were doing the wrong thing but they didn't realise when in reality a lot, the majority of them did realise that they were hurting another person. Your dad, for example, knew he was hurting you. 
He would like to believe that he didn't. But he did know that he was hurting him. And he needs to feel that emotion. Is there anything that you can advise me personally that I can do other than do what I'm doing and convey the message? And That's all you need to do, Jen. This no. generational stuff, frequently I'm having lately, many, many of my ancestors coming um, with questions of this nature, particularly around their choices in a situation of survival, that they made wrong choices that impacted on other members of their family yeah. in a sexual nature, because that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Um, but I've done it with other issues too, obviously. Yeah, yeah. as, as a, an expression of survival. Yeah, and, and this is a problem that they face, is that they are, they are, that basically what they're doing is saying, because I was in survival mode, that now validates my behaviour. So in other words, like if you come up and put a gun to my head, if I've got a gun, I'm allowed to shoot you. That's their reasoning, basically taken to a murderous point of view. Of view. That's not God's reasoning. Not God's reasoning. God doesn't agree with self-defence in any nature, and God doesn't agree either with a um, breaking God's laws for the sake for the sake of expedience, which is what this is. So, so if I choose to enter into a sexual transaction with another person because of the, because it's expedient to me, I've already broken a law, a law of love of God, and that's what they don't want to come to terms with, and they will need to come to terms with that if they want to progress. Does that make sense to everyone? Yeah. Like, like, just because you're being threatened with your life, that's no excuse for you to lie, for example, from God's perspective. Because from God's perspective, you're never going to die anyway. <laughs> with, like, in the wild, say, as a tiger attack, you use the same thing, like you studied here, or...? Um, obviously, from God's perspective, the soul of the human <coughs> has a higher nature than the others. Of the soul of the other creatures around about. The soul, the soul of the human is the pinnacle of God's creation. So bear that in mind with regard to my comments. If a tiger is attacking you, there's a law of attraction. Right? There is a law of attraction going on between you and this animal. It's the same with a dog attacking you. There's a law of attraction going on. Now, most of the time, these law of attractions are revolving around fear some kind of embedded fear within ourselves about animals or cre certain creatures that then, because of that fear, attracts the event. So a person who hasn't released all of their fear would be attracting that event. Or a person who is murderous in their nature towards animals may be attracting that event. Because an animal can respond in rage to your own murderous nature. Now, if you, went, if you were a vegetarian, like a vegan person, who had dealt with all their emotions about fear about animals and who had dealt with all of their own unworthiness feelings, no animal on earth will ever attack you. And I mean right down to a mosquito. Will never attack you. So you wouldn't, this then wouldn't become a question. Does that make sense? So again, if we look at it at the ideal level, there is no real question here. The real question is, what do I do when I've got all this unworthiness and I've got all these other feelings of, you know, all these other feelings I described in me, and then an animal attacks me? Well, you will, I know for certain, defend yourself. Well, no matter what I tell you, <laughs> you will defend yourself. How many of you do that? Mozzie comes along, what do you do? <laughs> Don't you? Yeah. All right. So what did just happen? A mozzie attacked you because of an emotion inside of you that you, you that you encouraged you encouraged this mozzie to attack him, and then you gave him a <laughs> whack, right? And deleted his existence uh, because, by the way, a mosquito doesn't have a spirit existence. So oh, that's good. <laughs> it's not a good thing. <laughs> so. So as, as we progress more and more and more, you'll find that these animals will not attack you. And the reason why they won't attack you is because there'll be no emotions inside of you to encourage the attack. And I've noticed this a lot with mosquitoes, for example. 
Um, like, if I'm sitting by myself outside, I think I mentioned this a few weeks ago, but it, uh, if I'm sitting by myself outside, um, I might get an occasional mosquito bite me. But when I say occasional, I haven't had any in the last few months. So, um, but, if, but if I'm sitting outside with another person who's got some self-attack emotions, they get eaten alive with mosquitoes. And like, when Corny came over, he got eaten alive with mosquitoes. <laughs> and witches and everything else that could come along and bite him. And he came up with these great big lumps all over his skin. And that is an emotion that drew that attack. So any animal, including the largest possible animal, including a shark in the sea, will only attack if the emotions in you allow that attack to occur. It's predominantly fear, but it's also emotions towards animals that you have. See, most people have, have an emotion towards animals of, I am going to dominate you, you are my food. So a lot of animals automatically feel a fear response because of your desire to eat meat, for example. Well, wouldn't you just have a fear? Like if I told you I was a, uh, a cannibal, <laughs> wouldn't you all of a sudden start, all of a sudden start uh, you know, worrying what, who might be next on my menu? And, and that's exactly what these animals feel from you. Not to take a piss, but do you know what happens to just out of curiosity. <coughs> Steve Irwin had an emotion in him where he was risk taking. He was risk taking because he felt he had to take risk because it made his life, him feel more alive. Yeah. And that emotion is what created his ultimate demise. Right? And some of you have had Steve Irwin come and chat with him. Yeah. Helga has. Bob, Bob, Bob. Oh, Bob has. That's yeah. right. A couple of people in the audience have. And. Uh, um, yeah, he, he, so his emotion was that, uh, that the risks got greater and, and because he didn't deal with the underlying emotion, the need for adrenaline, the need to feel alive, and that, that need caused his own death. So there'll be all sorts of reasons why animals will attack us. Yeah. Something, that, something you might be able to um, highlight me. When I was in mother's womb, mum was addicted to snipping petrol so much that she would smash it on her body. Yep. So that's fine. I'm just trying to tie up some things. I don't feel that was fine, but go on. <laughs> 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 and then there's um, disrespect gone through both sides of my family, my side and uh, evil side yeah. about men disrespecting women. Yeah. Um, so there's a the disrespect. My love and approval is growing immensely, but I've noticed the disrespect keeps coming at me day after day, and another one is judgment. Okay. So the truth is, you feel disrespected. So what you need to do is go into that emotion in a grief way rather than actually <coughs> trying to... Uh, there's this tendency in you at the moment to fight the person who's disrespecting you. Does that make sense? To defend yourself, to defend the disrespect. Do the opposite to that. Allow yourself to feel disrespected. Mm -hmm. Allow yourself to go into the grief of that. When you go into the grief of that, that takes away the causal emotion and you will no longer attract disrespected people disrespecting you. So you will know from the law of attraction whether you've released it. Yeah. Yep. And so, uh, no. When you when you feel it emotionally to its full expression, which is feeling disrespected, you'll go through grief doing it. When you feel it to its full expression, it will it will be not in you anymore and your law of attraction will show you that it's not in you anymore. Because you'll no longer, you'll find people are, oh, people respecting me automatically now yeah. without me having to say anything about it. Yeah. So, you know, that's why most people doubt my existence. Because yeah. I haven't dealt with the emotion yet. <laughs> so, with the, um, probably like um, a great offer of no love.
So stop trying to get it yeah. all together and just feel the results of not getting it. Because when you feel the results of not getting it, it's the same principle, that emotion will pass through you and from then on you'll start getting it. Yeah. So at the moment the law of attraction is triggering the emotion. It's 25 to 6. Um, that time went fast, eh? Hey? Now tomorrow what I would like to do is answer questions mostly surrounding this sexual stuff. I realise today there's stuff I haven't covered today, but I'll try and incorporate it in my answers tomorrow with you, if you come tomorrow. For those of you not coming tomorrow, thanks for your company today. And uh, um, hopefully it's been more lively than what I thought I would imagine <laughs> it was when I first walked in. And, uh, and thanks for your company. I hope I've answered most of your questions about those issues though. Um, there isn't any announcements, Pete, aside from we don't need a help cleaning up tonight. A bit maybe outside, but not much. Tomorrow we'll need that. But let's, let's let everyone uh, have the opportunity to say thank you to you. Yes. Yeah. Thank you.